Hello, and welcome to the final talk in our Special Collections Summer Seminar Series. I'm Anna Tunnicliffe, and I'm the Processing Librarian at the Iowa Women's Archives. Today's talk is entitled, When Iowans Voted No, the 1916 Referendum on Women's Suffrage. I chose to write this talk for a couple of reasons, the first being that we are rapidly approaching the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. That day will be August 18th, 2020. The other reason is that I want to share Iowa's role in the decades long fight for women's suffrage. Although we don't usually hear about Iowa in the national story, the state's journey was significant and unique. Women's suffrage in Iowa is a crucial part of the history of the Iowa Women's Archives. One of our founders, Louise Noun, literally wrote the book on it, Strong Minded Women, The Emergence of Women's Suffrage Movement in Iowa. It was during her research for this book that she first had the idea for an archives dedicated to women's history in the state. Since starting to work here five years ago, I have learned for the first time about Iowa's struggle to achieve women's suffrage. And although I'm not the expert yet, I'm eager to share what I know. In the spring of 1919, just months before Congress would pass the 19th Amendment, a reporter for the Des Moines Capitol wrote, Iowa one of the first states to consider equal suffrage and now certain to be one of the last states to adopt it. It was true that the Iowa's General Assembly first passed a resolution on women's suffrage in 1870, but nearly 50 years later, Iowa women still didn't have full suffrage. How did this come to be? Well, it's a long story that includes a quirky constitution and a crooked election. But before we get to that, let's get the lay of the land. Iowa's fight for suffrage goes back to the mid 1800s and includes some big names and many organizations that were building the case for women's suffrage. First, a couple names you might know from the national scene, Amelia Bloomer and Carrie Chapman Catt. Bloomer, yes, as in the Bloomer's fashion trend, resided in Iowa from 1855 until her death. Bloomer made waves not just with her clothing, but with her publication, The Lily, that advocated for women's suffrage. She was present at the Mount Pleasant Convention that formed the Iowa Women's Suffrage Association and served as its president from 1871 to 1873. Carrie Chapman Catt grew up in Iowa in the 1860s. In the 1880s, her first husband ran a newspaper in Mason City, Iowa, and she began advocating for suffrage in a column called Woman's World. By the late 1880s, her husband had died and she had devoted herself to the cause of suffrage quickly rising within the Iowa Women's Suffrage Association. Although she left Iowa after she remarried, Kat would return to the state and organize for suffrage many times during her national career. Aside from these two women you may have heard of nationally, Iowa had many vocal activists for the cause, as well as well-organized groups in favor of it. One of these groups was the Iowa Women's Suffrage Association, later known as the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association. It was founded in 1870 during a convention in Mount Pleasant. When the association was started, they stated that membership would be open to anyone, regardless of race, color, or sex. It was true, at least at the beginning, that men were involved in the organization. The impetus for its founding meeting in Mount Pleasant was a Quaker man, Joseph Dugdale, and its first president was also a man, Henry O'Connor. This trend of men in leadership positions would soon change, however. It seems However, it seems that women of color were not quite as welcome in the Women's Suffrage Association as white men were. The Iowa Women's Suffrage Association spread across the state and organizers like Cherry Chap Carrie Chapman Catt set goals to have the suffrage conventions in each of the 99 counties. It would later change its name to the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association, but its goal to bring full suffrage to Iowa women remained the same. The suffrage cause was also known to be associated with that of prohibition, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union was pretty big in Iowa. Iowa's chapter was founded in 1874, the same year as the national organization, and was made up of many already established temperance groups around the state. Further, the WCTU's president was Iowan Annie Wittenmeyer. The cause was also buttressed by many women's clubs in the state. It was common in the early 20th century and late 19th century for women to form study clubs that would keep their minds engaged and benefit their community. There were clubs like the Political Equality Club, 
and the Des Moines Suffragette Club that focused on equal suffrage and other study clubs like the Proteus Club or the Ida B. Wells Reading Circle that discussed suffrage among other issues. But they all gave women a forum to come together and organize for political causes. Two of the clubs I just mentioned, the Suffragette Club in Des Moines and the Ida B. Wells Reading Circle were associated with the Iowa Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which was founded in 1902. It ran parallel to the Iowa Federation of Women's Clubs, which was, without saying so in the name, generally white women's clubs. This is a good time to pause and talk about racism within the suffrage movement, and I want to give a shout out to Denise Pate Spruill, whose dissertation, From the Tub to the Club, Black Women and Activism in the Midwest, 1890 to 1920, really informed me on, a, on this topic that I didn't know much about. Although prior to the Civil War, women's suffrage was associated with abolition, after the 15th Amendment, there was a split. The right to vote had been granted to Black men before women, and the 15th Amendment had added male to the Constitution. This engendered resentment among some women. Others felt it was an injustice to them. So by the 1870s, there were two national women's suffrage organizations. The National Women's Suffrage Organization, led by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, opposed the 15th Amendment and the, Amer and the American Woman Suffrage Association, led by Lucy Stone and others, supported the 15th Amendment, believing that black men wouldn't gain the right to vote at all if it were contingent on women's suffrage as well. Before the founding of the Iowa Women's Suffrage Association, Amelia Bloomer was in contact with Lucy Stone, who suggested making sure the Iowa Association would be independent of the two factions. It's set up allowing men to take part and embracing, at least in words, the possibility of black members did make it a little more like the American Women's Suffrage Association though. The WCTU had a history of race issues as well. When the group was founded in 1874, it excluded Catholics, Jewish, and African American women. By 1881, they'd founded a department of colored work, but discrimination continued more or less unwritten. In 1896, Black women in Des Moines even spent some time discussing whether they should organize a separate WCTU within the city, but eventually the formerly white club accepted a Black member, though it's not clear, according to Spruill's dissertation, whether the group ever met at her home. By the time the Iowa Association of Colored Women's Clubs was founded in 1902, the two factions of the women's suffrage movement had again merged into the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and the WCTU had created their Department of Colored Work. But of course, this did not approach full inclusion. Frances Willard, who made comments on, quote, dark-faced mobs opposing temperance, was president of the WCTU until 1898, and in the National Suffrage Parade of 1913, Black delegates, including the activist Ida B. Wells, were told to march in the back of the parade. Despite this opposition, it's estimated that a few dozen Black women, including Wells, marched with their states. In her dissertation, Denise Pate Spruill researched heavily into Black women's political involvement before they had the vote in Iowa. She found a tenacity among the women similar to their national counterparts. They didn't let a racist society stop them from advocating for their goals, of which suffrage was just one. According to Spruill, Black women's clubs began popping up in Iowa cities in the late 1800s and supported racial uplift, education, health, and womanhood. The clubs they formed were most often literary societies and frequently named after figures the members admired, like Toussaint L'Ouverture and Ida B. Wells. Women in these clubs were concerned with protecting the vote of Black men as well as winning the vote for women and were also active in anti-lynching movements. However, as the women's suffrage cause began heating up in the 1910s, Black women were more explicitly involved. In 1913, the Des Moines Suffragette Club became the largest group in the Iowa Association of Colored Women's Clubs, and the group worked with white women's groups for their shared cause. The president of the Suffragette Club even hosted a tea at her home that was attended by the president of the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association, Flora Dunlap. In 1915, the Iowa Association of Colored Women's Clubs officially endorsed women's suffrage. In summation, Iowa had a strong pro-suffrage presence in its organized groups, in local women's clubs, state organizations, and a presence on the national stage. 
there was enough support among politicians that men had put forth suffrage proposals in the General Assembly in 1870 and had continued to do so several times over the next 40 years. So why didn't we just have suffrage already? What had stopped us from being one of the first states? Well, we had this quirky state constitution. Amending it to allow women to vote would take the approval of two consecutive general assemblies, meaning both the House and the Senate chambers. In these days, the General Assembly tended to meet every other year. Once it was twice approved, it would then go to the voters. And of course, every step of the way was decided solely by men who were the politicians and the voters across the state. The Iowa legislature got into a pattern of approving women's suffrage in one meeting and then rejecting it in the next. This went on to the point where Susan B. Anthony accused the state of playing a cat and mouse game with Iowa women. In 1894, Iowa did grant women partial suffrage. They could vote on bond issues, not for specific candidates or anything. They were still a long way from where they wanted to be. You can see Iowa in this map here as a partial suffrage state. Meanwhile, more and more states were allowing women to vote. Wyoming had become the first in 1869, followed by only three more states over the next 40 years. However, in 1910, there began a burst of approvals, which you can see in this chart here. Washington in 1910, California in 1911, Arizona, Kansas and Oregon in 1912, Alaska and Illinois in 1913, Montana and Nevada in 1914. Some of this was related to new strategies in the women's suffrage movement. Suffragists started taking pages out of the more aggressive British suffragettes books. According to Louise Noun in her book, Strong-Minded Women, the movement began to change in Britain in 1906 and quickly spread to the United States. Their new, more militant tactics included, quote, street meetings, picketing, parades, and civil disobedience. More experienced suffragists in the United States weren't initially impressed with these new tactics. Carrie Chapman Catt said, we do not have to win sympathy by parading ourselves like the street cleaning department or the police. However, by 1915, she too had participated in a suffrage march in New York City. However people might have felt about the militant suffragette, the tactics were working. When we think of suffrage today, the women marching with their banners and sash sashes is a common image. It's interesting to note that the tactic didn't emerge until the 1900s. The new militant tactics came to Iowa early. Iowa held one of the first suffrage parades in the nation, in Boone, Iowa, in 1908. About 150 women, led by a band, marched down the street for suffrage. At the end of their march, they stayed to hear a speech by the National American Women's Suffrage Association President, Anna Shaw Howard Shaw. Besides parades, Iowa organized automobile tours of the state in 1912 and 1913. The caravans of cars would drive into town and give speeches for suffrage. According to the Iowa Suffrage Scrapbook, an online resource produced by the Iowa Women's Archives and the Iowa State Historical Society in 2011, it's estimated that about 7,500 people saw one of these tours in their town. Also in 1913, the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association elected Flora Dunlap, a former settlement house worker who embraced these newer tactics to be their president. Finally, in 1915, a woman's suffrage amendment was passed for a second consecutive session of the General Assembly. It read, Repeal Section 1 of Article 2 of the Constitution of the State of Iowa, and in lieu thereof, enact and adopt the following to wit. Section 1, every citizen of the United States at the age of 21 years, who shall have been a resident of the state six months next preceding the election, and of the county of which he or she claims his or her vote 60 days, shall be entitled to vote at all elections, which are now or hereafter may be authorized by law. The moment had arrived. After decades of activism and many years of dashed hopes, Iowa women had a chance at full suffrage. They just had to convince the men of Iowa to vote for it on June 5, 1916. At the outset, suffragists had many reasons for confidence. Former Iowan Carrie Chapman Catt had just been reelected as the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association 
and she would devote time and money to supporting the campaign and training other activists. The Iowa Equal Suffrage Association had a strong leader themselves in Flora Dunlap. She organized a statewide automobile tour and would distribute over 5 million pieces of pro-suffrage literature. They had the endorsement of the Iowa Federation of Women's Clubs and the Iowa Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Aside from the women's obvious organized support, women's suffrage had the Iowa General Assembly behind it, the governor, the Iowa Supreme Court, and many other men of note in the state whose endorsements the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association would list on flyers. But there were groups and powerful interests opposed to women's suffrage as well. Organizations like the Iowa Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage and the Iowa Association of Men Opposed to Women's Suffrage were actively campaigning against it. Speakers were brought in like John Irish, which was a real blow since he'd been active in Iowa for suffrage in the 1870s. Now a Californian, he came back to tell Iowans about how awful things were in a state where women had suffrage. Among other things, it had apparently raised taxes and, quote, put lines on women's faces. Suffragists like Katz suspected that the opposition was funded by the liquor industry. Quick side note on Iowa and prohibition. Iowa was in a tricky place with it. At the same time as the suffrage amendment was trying to get through, temperance activists were trying to change Iowa law as well. Decades before the Iowa Supreme, decades before, the Iowa Supreme Court had struck down prohibition referendum on a technicality. For a while, counties had been able to choose prohibition or not for themselves, creating a patchwork of wet and dry counties across the state. In 1916, statewide prohibition was again on the agenda. The liquor industry had a vested interest in seeing that if the question of prohibition came to voters again, women would not be among them as they were strongly associated with temperance. The Iowa Women's Archives was fortunate to be working with the State Historical Society of Iowa on suffrage projects. With the two repositories combined, we've made a number of pro and anti-suffrage materials available on the Iowa Digital Library. I'm showing just a few of them here. The campaign used appeals on both sides that we might recognize today. The anti-side was particularly concerned with taxes. They were adamant that adding more voters to the rolls would cause an increase in the cost of elections and therefore raise taxes and also increase poll taxes. The suffrage group responded with arguments of their own. In one article, Plain Facts About Women's Suffrage for Honest Voters, they noted that California's poll tax was swept away after suffrage was granted and put together a chart of selected suffrage and non-suffrage states comparing tax rates. Another tried to assure voters by promising that women would not have to pay a poll tax at all. The bulk of the anti-suffragists' appeal was in what I'd call a fear of change. They felt that women had a natural place and natural strengths that didn't include voting. They worried that women voting would lead to more changes like female politicians. And it's important to point out that anti-suffrage rhetoric also came from women themselves who claimed that they didn't want the vote or they trusted men to represent them. One anti-suffrage flyer listed 11 reasons they felt women shouldn't have the vote. Among them that women are too emotional and will produce emotional legislation. Partisan contests just aren't good for women's characters and will make them fight with each other. And finally, concluding that, quote, anything American women really want, American men will give them on the ballot. Except the right to vote, I suppose. But the pro-suffrage camp also played into the idea that women's nature was just the reason they should vote. In a flyer entitled Equal Suffrage and the Schools, the argument was made that women had intuitive judgment and maternal instincts that would make them especially effective voters in school elections. Another flyer in which Bishop Austin Dowling of Des Moines endorsed suffrage for women stated that government calls, quote, quite as much for the motherly qualities of women as it does for the administrative and deliberative qualities of man. Although the suffrage movement seemed to believe that women's natures were different from men, they didn't rely on this in all of their appeals. They targeted flyers at rural voters, Catholic voters, and businessmen specifically. The thrust of many of their arguments in flyers like 12 Reasons Why Women Should Vote and Iowa Women in the Country 
was that laws affected women, their working conditions, their children and their homes, and although they had to obey these laws, they had no say in making them. The one that uh, hit me the most, perhaps for its unusual argument, um, put, was uh, who represents her? It put forth a number of scenarios, some of them kind of violent, uh, asking if a woman stole or killed or didn't pay taxes, if a man would take the punishment. It ended with a question, why is it that the only place in the world where a man wants to represent a woman is at the polls? Despite the variety and number of their appeals, the widespread support of the state's leadership and the major campaign funded by the National American Women's Suffrage Association, on June 5, 1916, Iowa rejected women's suffrage by 10,341 votes. It was true that between 1910 and 1916, 19 out of 26 suffrage referenda had been defeated, but something seemed fishy about the Iowa election. Nearly 30,000 more votes had been cast on the equal suffrage question than were cast for governor. The WCTU investigated and found 47 varieties of violation of election law in a survey of 44 counties. Perhaps unsurprisingly for the WCTU, they laid the blame on the loss on the liquor industry and the wet counties on the eastern part of the state, specifically Dubuque, Scott, Clinton, and Des Moines. You can see this in the that they tried to explain why these counties were against suffrage. You can see them on the side here, pointing out what number of the population was foreign or foreign parentage, and specifically how many of them were German, Austrian, or Russian. The ensuing chart was published in a newsletter. I think this is kind of some unnecessary nativism that would foster resentment against specific groups, However, they were right that the defeats in those counties were particularly steep. Equal suffrage lost by 4,444 votes in Dubuque County alone, and more than 2,000 in Scott and Clinton counties. They were far from the only places where suffrage lost, of course. Uh, for those of you locals wondering, equal suffrage was defeated in Johnson County by 967 votes, and in Lynn by 1,491. I didn't find any data, though, on how many foreigners lived there. The WCTU also found a lot of fraud. You can see it mapped out here. The yellow counties went for equal suffrage and the white counties against. Each colored triangle around the counties indicated a different kind of election fraud that occurred there. Remember that WCTU only surveyed 44 counties. Perhaps there was more. Um, they found more flagged issues in counties that went against suffrage but even the counties that went for it had plenty of problems. Some of the irregularities like unused ballots not being returned might have come from carelessness, but others like not giving or giving the wrong opening time for the polls or not putting the amendment on the same ballot as the other public measures maybe suggest sabotage. Especially damning were the counties where there were more votes than names on the list of voters. This appears to have occurred in Dubuque, Scott, Clinton, and Des Moines counties, along with about a dozen other counties. Overall, in 15 counties, there were 8,067 more votes than voters. Despite all the evidence that the vote had been stolen from Iowa women, there was nothing they could do. To add insult to their injury, the amendment passed the House again in 1917, but was nullified due to a filing error. Iowa women wouldn't have a victory until 1919, when Iowa became the 10th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. They, among the rest of America's women, would finally cast their ballots fully enfranchised in 1920. All right, thank you. I have some additional sources listed here that I drew from. Um, I would suggest the uh, Women's Suffrage in Iowa online exhibit, the Suffrage Scrapbook, and checking out the Iowa Digital Library, Women's Suffrage in Iowa collection. Thank you.